We're going to be in 2 Corinthians, back in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, if you want to uh, turn there in your Bible this morning. Let's, uh, if you didn't bring a Bible, there should be one near you in, in one of the, uh, under one of the seats. You're welcome to use that. Uh, let's, uh, let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. It is powerful. It is alive. It's at work in us this morning. And we together want to be open to what you are wanting to do in us this morning. So fill us with your spirit, open our hearts up to you, soften us, give us ears to hear, give us hearts to respond to, to what you want to say to us today. We pray that we would be teachable, uh, that we would be eager to hear the voice of our shepherd and follow. Work in us, we pray, for your glory, for the sake of your great name, in Jesus' name we ask it, amen. We're in 2 Corinthians, we're going to look to this morning at verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, and we've been away from 2 Corinthians for a while, I think it was uh, late November that we took a break, so we're jumping back in, so I want to look back over these first verses to get our bearings on where we're at in the book. The first verses, Paul introduces himself with divine authority. But he makes it clear he's not alone. He mentions his unity with his co-workers. And he addresses this new community with a new identity. The church of God. He calls them saints. He identifies their new relationship, peace, with God. Peace that only comes through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're familiar with Paul's letters, you notice something missing. He omits the thanksgiving. Often he thanks God for something about his readers. He doesn't do that in 2 Corinthians. Instead, he invites them to bless God with him. God is worthy to be worshipped because He is merciful even when we get ourselves into trouble. He gives strength in the middle of adversity and He gives purpose to our afflictions so that we can in turn comfort others with the comfort with which we have received from the Lord. He identifies and corrects their thinking. He says the normal Christian life is not a life of comfort and ease. The normal Christian life is a life that is a cross-shaped life, a life of suffering for the good of others, of sharing the sufferings of our Lord Jesus. Verse 8, he lets them in on his own struggles, on his own trials, his own sense of despair. He points to the purpose of that despair, to wean him from self-confidence, so that his confidence would be in God and God alone, the God who raises the dead. They can have confidence in future rescue because God has always been faithful. Instead of thanking God for his readers, Paul invites in verse 11 the Corinthians to help him by their prayers in order that thanksgiving might be multiplied when the many who prayed see God's blessing in response to their prayers. Paul boasts in the grace of God, not in his own wisdom, not in his own efforts. As the driving principle of his life, he points forward to that final day when both he and this church will boast in each other, in the very presence of Jesus. 
verses 15 and 16, Paul begins to explain his change of travel plans, which, as it seems, must have created tension in their relationship. You said you were coming, and then you didn't come, and now you're coming at a different time, and you said you were going to do this, and you didn't do that. Why? Don't you like us? Don't you want to see us? He, he begins to explain his desire, his heart was to afford them a second experience of grace, a double opportunity to financially invest in his ministry as they would send him on his way to serve others. He made his plans, he says, ultimately for your good. And then he grounds his decision making in the nature and the character of God. God is faithful. They're calling his faithfulness into questions. He says, I'm submitting to the Lord. The Lord is faithful. God is for us in the gospel. God says yes to us in Jesus. As many as, as, many as the promises that God made, all of them find their yes in Jesus. Find their fulfillment in Jesus. Jesus. The Son of God came to be in them, came to live among them through His preaching. He says, Jesus is in you through our preaching, the gospel to you. Jesus is among you. This church exists to bring glory to God. He makes His decisions to bring glory to God. It's all about God's glory. And it is through Jesus that we get to say the Amen to God for His glory. If you look back over the section in verse 3, He blesses God in verse 11. He multiplies thanksgiving to God in verse 14. They will mutually boast in the grace of God. Verse 20, it is through Jesus together we say the Amen to God for His glory. It's all about God and His glory. The word Amen is actually a Hebrew word brought over into the Greek of the New Testament. So they didn't translate it, they just transliterated it. Amen is Hebrew, and they just brought it over and made up a new word, which they also did in English. You guys know Hebrew. Everybody say Amen. 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 You speak in Hebrew. <laughs> That's a Hebrew word. Revelation 3.14, Jesus is actually called the Amen. It's one of his names. But this Hebrew word brought over into the Greek language and then now today into our language, it means it's firm, trustworthy, surely. Let it be confirmed. Let it be established. So be it. So when you... When you when you say the Amen, often in the New Testament, you see this Hebrew word show up a lot in the New Testament, and it's often after a doxology. God is worthy to be praised. Amen. What it means is, yes, so be it. Let it be established. What you just said, let that happen. Let that be established. That's what it means. It's interesting in verse 21, he picks this thought up. We say the amen to God, but let it be established to God for His glory. And then he picks up with a Greek word that means to make firm, steadfast, or confirm. God is the one who establishes us. We can say amen, or let it be established to the glory of God, because God is the one who establishes us with you in Christ. All the promises of God are made firm, are confirmed to us in Jesus. God is the one who establishes us in Christ through the gift of His Spirit. To God be the glory. We stand firm because of the establishing work of the triune God. We say establish it, God, because God is establishing us. Paul used this same word, establish, or confirm, or 
translated sustain back in 1 Corinthians 4. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 6, actually. Verse 4 says, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed, established, made sure among you. And then down in verse 7, our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 8, who will sustain, confirm, establish you to the end, guiltless. In the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. That word confirm, the word sustain in 1 Corinthians 1 6 and 1 8 is the same word here in 2 Corinthians 1 21, translated established or establishes. The testimony of Christ, the gospel, was confirmed, established, made sure in you. Our Lord Jesus Christ will confirm, establish, make you sure to the end. That's the past, that's the future aspect of God's establishing work. He established the testimony of Christ, the gospel. He will establish you irreproachable, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here in 2 Corinthians, he's looking at the ongoing, the present Work of establishing. God is today at work establishing us. It is God who establishes us with you in Christ. And has anointed us. Who has also put his seal on us. And given us his spirit in our hearts. As a guarantee. Let's look at that passage together. Notice. Notice the together aspect of God's establishing work. God establishes us with you. Paul and his co-workers, he, speaking to the church in Corinth, us with you. God establishes us with you. This is not, I'm on my own over here and God's establishing me and you're on your own over there. Being on your own established by the Lord as if it were some private, personal thing. This is a together with thing. Do you see that in the text? So much of the Bible is a together with thing. Yes, of course, God works in us each individually, personally. He loves you individually, personally, specifically. But our culture is one of independence, of isolation. We need to pay attention to the us together with you. God works in relationships. It is often in the together with relationships that God does his sanctifying work. We all want to be established in Christ, don't we? We often unknowingly resist that work in our lives. I was the youngest of eight, of five. Uh, there's eight years between me and my nearest sibling. So much of my life I grew up as kind of an only child. I didn't really have to learn to get along with others. Uh, I enjoyed a great deal of independence. After I began to walk with Jesus, I could honestly look at myself and think, I think I'm, I think I'm doing pretty well. I was so even-tempered that some of my high school friends would actually do things to see if they could get me stirred up and angry, and most of the time it didn't work. It's like, like don't you ever get mad? I, I heard that. Then, I got married. <laughs> now my wife, you know, is an amazing person. And I know most of you won't believe me when I say this, but she's, 
She is a sinner. And I'm a sinner. And I'm not saying that she brought out the worst in me. But that in the relationship, in, the, in a close, intimate relationship with another person, it stirs up some of the junk that's in there that was clogging up my heart. Some of that sin, some of that selfishness, some of that pride. It was in there all along. But it became more visible. And that's not a bad thing. That's actually a good thing. You see, if I don't know it's there, I can't deal with it. I can't ask God to deal with it in me. I can have this, all this junk just sitting there clogging up the arteries of my heart, and I don't even know it. I can even become prideful thinking, oh, look, I'm pretty clean. I'm better than others. I, that's the worst sin of all. So often, when this happens, people, people see this happening in a relationship and they want out. She brings out the worst in me. It just makes me so mad. Friends, that's by design. That's on purpose. And it's a good purpose. That's the point. It, she brings out the worst in me. It was in me. She didn't put it there. It was already in there. It needed to be brought out into the open so it could get addressed. Work out healthy patterns of relationship, confession, forgiveness, reconciliation. And then we had kids. <laughs> right? It's like, wow. I, my friends at high school, they couldn't make me mad. I got mad over what? My heart's a mess. I didn't see that in there. You see, God works in us through relationships, especially through the junk in relationships. The hurt, the offense, the misunderstanding, the pain. Celebrate that. I'm not saying go around and hurt people. Don't do that. What I'm saying is when you are hurt, celebrate that God loves you. That He is at work in you, showing you, you, so that he can make you the you he intends for you to be. God is establishing us with you. It is a together thing that God does in and through relationships with others. See that in the text. He's establishing us with you. There's a relational aspect to this that's so important. Notice also the ongoing activity of God in this establishing work. This is a present action founded on past completed actions. Establishes is present. It is founded on past complete actions has anointed, has sealed, has given us His Spirit, those are past. Establishes is present, it is continuous, it is ongoing, it is not done yet. God is continually at work in us together with you, establishing us, confirming us, making us steadfast. This is a process. We often refer to this as sanctification. We're becoming 
more like Jesus. We're becoming more holy. He's at work in us, stirring up the junk so he can clear it away. Notice, Paul the Apostle puts himself and his ministry partners right in there with the Corinthians. He doesn't say, I have been established and now God is establishing you. No, God establishes us with you. The Apostle Paul is a work in progress. And he needs the Corinthians and their messy relationship for God to do his work in him. So I'm, I'm being worked on through this whole thing too. Notice also who is doing the establishing. God gets the glory. Amen. Establish us, Lord, because God is the one who is doing the establishing. Us with you are the recipients of God's establishing work. I can't make myself firm, sure, steadfast. I can't confirm myself. This is God's work. God's work in me. The triune God is the one who does this. See that in the text? God in Christ by giving us His Spirit. This is the triune God at work in me. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit conspiring together to confirm and establish us together with you. He's working in us. That's powerful. That's powerful. The triune God at work in us. In the midst of messy relationship. Establishing. Let's look at how he does this. He lists three things, all past actions, all connected with the work of the Holy Spirit in us. Each one of these is worthy of its own sermon, but we're going to go through them quickly. Anointed, sealed, given the Spirit as a guarantee. Those three. God anointed us. Now, here's something you miss in English. There's a play on words here. In the Greek, it reads, Ace Christon Kai Chrysos. You hear the similarity in the words there? Christon Chrysos. We could, because the title Christ, Christon, is a title, it's not his last name, Jesus Christ. It's a title that means the anointed one. It, we could translate this phrase, God establishes us with you in Christ, the anointed one, and has anointed us. Or God establishes us with you in Christ and has christened us. Might be a, another possible way to translate that. In the Old Testament, prophets, priests, kings, were anointed with oil as a way to set them apart for their specific office of service. Take oil, you dump it over their heads. You're setting this, this person apart. Samuel finds Saul and then later David and he pours oil over his head and says, God has set you apart to be king of Israel. The priests, the prophets, poured oil over their heads, set them apart for service. Jesus, our great prophet, priest, and king, was anointed with the Holy Spirit. Jesus, the Christ, is the anointed one. And this text is beautiful because it links us so closely with him. I believe this is the only verse that tells us that God has anointed us. Christ is the anointed one, but this links us with Christ and says, God has anointed us together with you. 1 John chapter 2 talks about the anointing we have received. 
Anointing gives divine enablement for service. Acts chapter 10, verse 38, he refers to how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And then it goes on to say, he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Anointing a power for service. Jesus himself says in Luke 4, 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed. God anointed his son Jesus with the Holy Spirit for service. And God has anointed us like Jesus with the Holy Spirit for service to others. His establishing work, part of that establishing work is he has anointed, he has poured out, Romans 8 says, his spirit on you who believe in Jesus. He's anointed us with his spirit, equipped us and set us apart for the work he's called us to do. He's anointed us and it says God has sealed us. Now sealing was a mark of ownership, of protection, of authenticity, of authority. A king, someone with authority, had a seal, often a ring or a cylinder on a cord that could be pressed into hot wax or soft clay to leave an official mark or impression. We've got a couple illustrations here. On the left, this is the seal of Queen Jezebel. Uh, it's in the Jerusalem Museum, I believe. Uh, it actually, in, uh, in characters, you have uh, uh, belonging to Jezebel is, is what it says on that, uh, scattered around that seal. That's a, a round seal that would be pushed into, uh, into wax. Uh, we, we know from 1 Kings 21.8 that Jezebel, Queen Jezebel, uh, used her husband Ahab's seal to order the execution of Naboth. Because they wanted his, his property. Uh, that's, that's an ancient seal. Uh, the one on the right here is an example of a cylinder seal. This is a cylinder that would be rolled across clay. And the image isn't great, but you can see it left an impression in the clay to the right there. Uh, as you roll it across, it presses in, into that. Uh, this is the seal, uh, it's believed, of Xerxes or Ahasuerus, and it actually uh, has a representation of Queen Esther in that seal, uh, about uh, 500 B.C.-ish, I believe, is, is the dating of that one. Uh, we read in Esther of sealing official documents with the king's signet ring. Matthew 27 Jump ahead to the New Testament, talks about the tomb of Jesus. The Pharisees are concerned. This guy said he was going to like raise again. We're afraid the disciples might come and steal the body. Pilate says, go make it secure, seal it. Under the authority of Pilate, the tomb of Jesus was sealed with something like those kind of seals. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 5 talks about a scroll with seven seals. Each of those seals would have to be broken by a person with the right credentials. Not just anybody can break the seal of the king. The seven seals on the scroll in Revelation 5. Revelation 7 talks about the servants of God receiving a seal on their foreheads, marking them out as belonging to God, securing their protection. Sealed. Look at Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1 talks about God blessing us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. He chose us to be holy. He predestined us for adoption. He redeemed us. He forgave our sins. He predestined us for an inheritance. 
And Ephesians 1.12 says, So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. In this verse we see that the Holy Spirit is both the seal and the guarantee of our inheritance. When we heard the good news, when we believed in Jesus, we were sealed. Again, past action, completed action. He has sealed us. When we believed in Jesus, we were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. We were marked out as belonging to God. Stamped with His authority. His own imprint. Protected. Now that's our part. We hear the gospel. We believe the gospel. We trust. We rely on. We depend on Jesus. God seals us with His Spirit. In Ephesians 4.30, we're told that by what we say, by things that come out of our mouths, we can grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God for the day of redemption. He has placed His stamp on us. We are protected. We are preserved by Him. We bear His mark of authority and authenticity. Anointed. Sealed. Given the deposit of His Spirit. God is establishing us. It's ongoing. He has anointed us. He has sealed us, and He has given us the guarantee of the Spirit in our hearts. Now, a guarantee, these are, some of these are legal terms. A guarantee was a down payment or an earnest given. Now, this is different from a pledge. Some translations use pledge here. That's not accurate. It, it misses the point. It, it uh, doesn't paint the picture correctly. A pledge we see in Genesis 38 in the story of Judah and Tamar, kind of a seedy story. This is one of those that you don't want to read to your kids at bedtime. It's like, they did what? <laughs> there's, some, there's some great stuff in the Bible. It's real. Um, but he gives Tamar his signet, his cord, and his staff as a pledge that he would send the proper payment. And he expected to get those things back once he sent the payment. It was a pledge. It's like, I'm going to give you my, my driver's license because I need to you know, run out to my car and grab the money. And when I come back, I'm going to give you the money. You're going to give me my pledge, my driver's license back. Or you don't get to keep my driver's license. That's just showing you that I'm really going to come back and give you what I promised you, right? That's, that's a pledge. That's not the Spirit. The Spirit is not a pledge. The Spirit is a deposit or a guarantee. A different legal term. An earnest, a down payment. That is the first part of the payment that guarantees that the full payment will be made. So if you're buying a house, you don't give them your driver's license. You give them a big sum of money. It's like, boom, here's... Here's cash. Now, that's a promise that well, I'm going to come through. I've, I've, I've invested in this thing. I've shown that I'm serious about it. I'm not going to walk away from that earnest money, that guarantee. It, it guarantees that I'm going to show up and I'm going to pay the balance. I'm going to, I'm going to pay month to month until that thing's paid off. Because I've invested in it. But, but I'm not expecting you to give my initial investment back. No, that's part of the payment. You keep it. That is the picture of the Holy Spirit. Earnest money as part of the payment, not returned when payment is made. God has given us His Spirit 
Listen, in our hearts, as a down payment, as a guarantee. Later in 2 Corinthians 5, he talks about our resurrection bodies. When what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God who has given us his spirit. As a guarantee. And this passage points out that this gives us confidence. Even in the face of discouragement and adversity. We can have confidence. God has put his money down. God has not put his money down. That he could walk away from. God has given us his spirit. He's never going to walk away. He doesn't take it back. We already looked at Ephesians 1, which uses both the sealing word and the guarantee word. Ephesians 1.13, In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. Brothers and sisters, isn't it great that we haven't gotten our full inheritance yet? You look around this world and frustration and pain and suffering and this, this, this isn't it. This isn't all there is. There is more to come. God has made amazing promises and every one of them to us is yes in Jesus. And we've got His Spirit living in us as a guarantee that He's going to come through on every bit that He has made a promise about. The Holy Spirit is the seal of our inheritance, marking the authenticity, marking the ownership, protecting and preserving it for us, us for it. The Holy Spirit is the earnest, the down payment of our inheritance, the first installment of what we will receive. The Holy Spirit in our hearts is not temporary, not to be replaced later by something else. He is ours for eternity. God the Holy Spirit, anointing us for service, sealing us as His, living inside of us as the guarantee of an eternity with Him. Oh, treasure, treasure the gift of the Holy Spirit in your hearts. God is doing His establishing work in us. This is a gift. Don't try to earn. Freely receive. Trust Him. Lean in. Embrace what He is doing. He began the work. He will complete it. He guaranteed it. By putting His own Spirit in our hearts. And respond. Respond with the hearty Amen. Glory to the triune God who establishes us with you. Makes us firm. Makes us steadfast. Confirms us. Amen. Establish us, O oh Lord. Father, thank you for this truth. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. God dwelling in us, sealing us as yours, poured out over us to empower us for service, to bring pleasure to you. Thank you that you are at work and you are not done yet. Thank you that your work is a a process. And it involves one another. Thank you that you actually redeem relationships and you redeem tension and hurt. <coughs> For your ultimate purpose, you are shaping something in us. You are transforming us by your Holy Spirit. God, you're at work doing something beautiful in each one of us and we want to celebrate that. We want to thank you and worship you today and recognize that 
you are great and you are worthy of our worship. And Lord, we want to surrender to your work. We want to say, Amen, establish us in Christ by the gift of your Spirit. Thank you that you promised that you don't give up on us. You began a good work and you will carry it through to completion. And we have your spirit living inside of us as the, the absolute certainty of, of a guarantee that you will not go back on your word. You will make every promise come, come true in us. Help us to lean into you and embrace the work that you're doing in us for your glory. For the sake of your great name we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.